Welcome to A Pint with Shoney B. It's summer in London, which means it's raining outside. My guest has cycled here from where have you come from? I came originally from Dalston in East London. It's okay, Dalston. so he's travelled quite a long way to be here and he's very yeah. kindly fitted in with my plans. He's a fellow, you, those of you with perceptive hearing on what he just said may pick out an Irish accent. He is a filmmaker, writer, performance artist. He's also from Kerry, which is the best county in Ireland because I'm my people hail from there as well. And his name is Dennis Buckley. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Sean. Hardly your first podcast. No, no, I have been. I have had experience of speaking about myself in the <laughs> past. <laughs> um, one thing might, might be good for people to do is to go to your website before they listen to you, because I think there's a, there's a lot of deep stuff in there that I want to tease out of you. Sure www.dennisbuckley.com One N as they spell it One in N, Ireland exactly, in Kerry exactly. not like the English who have insisted over and the, the years the double N yeah it's really? kind of a, yeah, it's a bit like Sean has, a, has problems yeah. problematic yeah. in that, in that it's area it's problematic as Quiver or no. Siobhan yeah. but nonetheless it's been Maeve a, Maeve that really upsets me um, what was it like growing up in Killarney I, do you know it, great place to grow up I mean it, it doesn't uh, resemble any other small town no. of its size because of the influx that takes place. Yeah. You know. So let's just paint a picture for overseas viewers. Kerry is in the, if you imagine Ireland as a teddy bear, it's in the, it's in the legs of the teddy bear down southwest of Ireland. It's mountainous and it is beautiful. And Killarney is the place where most of the Irish Americans who come tend to at some point stop yeah. off there. Yeah, I mean, it is reasonably described as kind of like the center of tourism outside of, outside of the capital. The basis of its tourism is its spectacular scenery. Mm. Now, my partner and I, we go and travel places uh, as the, the sun may be going down over an Adriatic Sea or wherever yeah. it may be. I turn to her and say, it's nice, but it's not Kerry, is it? It's not you as know, good. It's not Killarney. It does get a bit of a bagging from Irish people because it's a bit leprechaun, it's a bit hokey. Sure. I mean, I can see it from both sides, inevitably, mm. you know. And I, I would like to make a distinction, really. Growing up as a small boy, cycling around, going around yeah. the National Park was fantastic, you know. But as a teenager, I found it a stifling environment. Yes. You know? uh, and that was more to do with not necessarily Killarney itself, but the country as a whole. It was deeply, deeply conservative. I myself was uh, confirmed by certain Bishop Casey on his way probably back to West Kerry yeah. uh, before I, I can't say that with any certainty but yeah. that was you know that was the environment that I was in and um, I found it particularly oppressive. So Ireland being churched uh, very religious both of us are a similar vintage mm. growing up in the 70s and 80s uh, repressive is the word repressive in terms of priests interfering with mainly boys <laughs> He referred to Bishop Eamon Casey, who was a, a, a bishop, i.e. appointed by the Pope, who had uh, got a, a woman from America pregnant, and that blew up, and, and, and the whole church, probably from that time, started crumbling yeah, around us, which I is, think I think, so. a good I thing. I mean, in retrospect, I do remember the effect of his downfall, if it were, upon people of a certain generation. You know, it, it shocked some of them, and I think the solidity of which that was founded upon then began to... To begin to crumble, you're right. You're yeah. right. But I was fortunate in one way, Sean, because what happened was in Kerry at the time as well, there was a great alternative culture. And as a teenager, I met some fascinating people who were living alternatively. Before. And describe alternative, you mean? Uh, there were hippies, basically. Overseas was, artists yeah, coming yeah, in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was a fantastic festival that took place on Whit Weekend every year that was organized by that community. And it was fantastic. I mean, a wonderful a, a kind of a, a whole town given over to alternative culture and inevitably it had an effect upon me because I suppose I have in some sense been in and around alternative lifestyles ever since. Were you artistic in school? Christian Brothers were you? Uh, no I went to a seminary I, I had oh, the whole thing I had the um, St. Brendan's College a monastery and a convent so I had I, it's safe to say that I everybody within the church had a scale part of me at some stage. You know? Were they so, pressurizing you to be a priest? or Not particularly, but the pressure was internal as well because of the nature of the, you know, it's hard to comprehend that in retrospect. The inference and the indoctrination is so intense mm. from an early age that you are somehow drawn to that lifestyle as well. Yeah. You know, it's impossible not to be. But I had a, a certain experience as a teenager which was enough to kind of send me into a different road. You, know, you and weren't that abused or anything? No, I wasn't. No. No. My father died when I was about 14 and I kind oh. of just went, I don't care anymore. You know? Accident or? No, he died of natural causes. Okay. And, uh, okay. I just kind of went from there. I didn't really listen to anybody after that. It coincided then with this encountering of this alternative cultures and introducing to different sort of ways. Did you of kind of, did it give you the 
out to stop believing in God? Well, why would God? Oh do yeah, that to I you? think that that was. It's clear that that was a that was the the kind of point that how yeah. could you see a benevolent deity and then mm. have the effect of loss yes. permeate your family? Yes. and it's 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 horrific, you know. Uh, and, and also, I was I was on the cusp between boyhood and teenageness, yeah. and I wasn't in the right position. So did you that. start rebelling then and get yeah, becoming difficult? Was, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was understandable. And how was your mum? My mum, uh, you know, she was older when I was born, so she was of a particular radio generation. Now, what she did not anticipate was her 18-year-old son wearing her scarves and having pink hair. No mother in Ireland at that time. No mother anticipated that her son would be kind of looking the way I looked, yeah. acting the way I acted, yeah. and having attitudes that I had. So it was very difficult. Were you doing drugs then or anything? Yeah. Like? Okay, so that part mainly down a little bit? Yeah, I mean, that was, that was that. And then, you know, obviously there were other yeah. sort of whatever you got your hands on, really. And did the <laughs> art bit, where did that come from? One thing about Colony is it was the, the site of the first talking movie in Ireland called The Dawn, which was a sort of nationalist show, but it was made and filmed in Colony by a, a filmmaker called Tom Cooper. Now it is... <laughs> still recognized or always be recognized what are we the talking 30s 36 right. and I remember that man because he had a cinema in Killarney which would be able to support that but it was a triple cinema yeah. so there was the option to go to wow. various different cinemas and I more or less lived in there and also as a teenager I would go off on my own go to the kids film and sneak in and see the, what would have been called the big film yeah. you know? so I accessed that and you know I've referenced it in, in works that I've done in the, uh, in the past where it's the, it's the allure of crush velvet you know interior of a cinema yeah, you know, good. and the lights going down but it was the idea that somebody felt that they could yeah. begin and make a film where there wasn't a history of filmmaking because film was relatively new you know? did you feel were you loner a bit eventually you would be identified by your head scarves but certainly that <laughs> but also you know if you dressed in the 1970s and early 80s as flamboyantly yeah. you ran the risk of getting hammered yeah. So you had to either be quick with it or just plain quick. Yeah. I think one of the things that I saw about it was that it wasn't somewhere that I was going to stay around. Yeah. You know, I mean, I didn't see anticipate at any stage that yeah. it was going to be a long term. You're, you're waiting to get to eighteen. I couldn't wait to get, and also something that was really curious about my teenage years was Sorry. I would look around my class and I would kind of say, "When we grow up, this shit's not going to be the same." You know, there's a, there's, I'm, I'm feeling a cinema paradiso kind of yeah, there was, there feel was a to your life. Yeah. I mean, I, I did really, I did really spend a lot of time in the cinema, and I yeah. must. I, I've told this to somebody recently, and I don't know uh, to give the cinema paradiso. Uh, uh, extend the analogy is there was also in that cinema there had posters outside, and if you remember, there was a period in the 1970s where there were Italian movies that were dubbed, badly dubbed, yeah. that came. Yeah. And the third cinema would get these Italian movies, and they were usually bare-chested women. But I remember, and this, like, I can't believe this is a false memory, that the bare-chested women on the poster were coloured in with black marker. That would be right. That's probably still the case in I would, Killarney. I, I mean, I, 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 wouldn't have, I wouldn't anticipate it. <laughs> it's, it probably is the same type of thing. But it was, it was a time where you thought that things... I mean, I left Ireland when I was 20, and the reason I went, I know now, was that I understood that it was impossible for me to grow in the way that I thought I, I could. I left for that reason. Yeah. I couldn't wait to get to 18. Yeah. I found it very fucked up when I was in my teens. But I, the hypocrisy and the, the, the twitching curtains and the gossip, everything was a front for something that was just... Yeah. When you put your finger in the wound in Old Ireland... It was just horrible and full of worms. You well, know, it looked nice on the outside. Yeah, there was something also in, in the period of time which I was to look at longer and inevitably living here during the 1980s. There were questions to be asked about the identity. And, you know, one of the things that I was able to look at as a result of being and living here was the idea of these great sort of ideas of national identity. And, mm. and some of those I found wanting. But I did have a Like good, what? Uh, I think uh, the notion of fidelity to a, a notion of Ireland. Right. Um, nationalism. Yeah, but it, I mean, I, I would be probably safe to say that nationalism, maybe in time, would go out of favour and can come back into favour again. Right. And I would hope to suggest that nationalism may come back, but not in the narrow sort of parochial sense that yeah. we see happening in Hungary or America or even in the United Kingdom. I couldn't actually pinpoint what it was that was being spoken of when mentioning the word Ireland. There is a difference between nation and state. There is a difference between the landscape, which is there, but the, the administratory state is one that I found 
most objectionable. If I was to say what was most objectionable about them is that they had a very bad line in dress. There was always an atrocious looking suit telling you what to do, you know? And I think that in that, that sense... smell, actually. There was a we sense of that we as well. Wash ourselves. Yeah, but it was, I mean, amenities. If you, if you, That's true. Yeah. If people have a look, there's a, there's a journal... They were a third world country for... Yeah. Well, it's interesting. There's a journal article I wrote for, or an article I wrote for the journal about uh, the Bob Marley concert in July 1980, which I attended. In mm. that, I described some of the amenities that yeah. passed for it was a pit. decent sort of uh, living and they were they were poor you know? yeah. it just means that I've been left with a questioning of these kind of shibboleths all the way through my adult life you've got a, a Catholic bourgeoisie who for the most part are represented by the two major parties yeah. and that has always been yeah. the case I mean but also what what's curious about me and this is a, something that I've asked of myself because association to to a nation or to the responsibility that I feel in terms of an artistic practice is also necessarily not to find that you run the risk of being incorporated into something that you're you're not necessarily uh, enamored with so for example there's a cultural hegemony in terms of arts funding within Ireland yes. as there is in the United Kingdom it's difficult to say to yourself that you'd be critical of that funding process because you put yourself at risk arm's length never getting yeah of course but there is still a responsibility where you feel to what do I owe and to whom do I owe the actions that I carry out and whom am I ultimately responsible to? And personally, I'm not responsible to an administratory state, you know? Do you feel you're playing for Ireland, though? No, not no. at all. Quite frankly, you know, I could never foresee myself standing up in any crowded room and mouthing the words of the rugby song, yeah. uh, which I find uh, yeah. abhorrent, you know? Yeah. I want to be in. Yeah, but you know, I don't necessarily believe that all Irish history is a is a series of benevolent Protestants helping a, a Catholic underclass. No, you know, no. Uh, I see it as somewhat different. You know, but there. It, one but I don't think it was a religious war. It no, was not a necessarily. Land war, and then it became a religious war in the, in the recent troubles. But I view history from a narrative perspective. Right. Who owns the narrative, and where does it yes, where does true. it go? And the narrative true. in the most recent past has been inevitably a benevolent one towards all aspects of the yes. thirty-two counties. But that brings in its own questions then, against in terms of definition of state, definition of nation, definition of land as yeah. well. You know, my view is we need as a race, as a species, to break down the idea of country because we need to fix, I think we need to fix the world. We don't just need to fix homelessness in our country. We need to fix starvation globally as a species and the world and the crisis it's facing now. Everything and is interconnected. if we're all starting to get a bit fucking back to whatever notion of nationalism or populism that is all about, no, fuck off, leave us alone. It doesn't work. I mean, we're, it well, doesn't we're all going to, there'll I mean, be it, another it world war then. And it is perceived, you know, whatever is about the English experience of Brexit is they perceive that their sovereignty is lost, they, yeah. lost, they perceive that there are too many immigrants. The facts will never belie that yeah. because they perceive that to be the case. Unelected participation in terms of, of decision making. The central bank is unelected, you know, the yeah. judiciary is unelected. All of these things affect people on a daily basis. That's not the popular argument, no. you know. And you have carpetbaggers who will come along and they will take advantage of that. Now, my responsibility at the moment, I think, in terms of artistic output, is to counter that narrative and I counter that narrative by identifying what we share as similarities and what we share ultimately is our ability to suffer. My most recent project which is the one that I'll be taking to, Go to Galway at yeah. 126 in, in September. There'll be a link to this at the end podcast. Yeah. So um, it's based on the experience of going to the foot of uh, Renfrew Tower the day after the fire, which was still burning at that stage. Okay. Grenfell Tower, huge, Grenfell disastrous people. fire in the seventy-two London people. with terrible yeah. building materials and cutting corners. And this, this is an area that I made a decision early on to say what was the thing that was most effective about the experience of being there under Grenfell on that, that night, the night yeah. after. And what was most effective was the fact of seeing the fire still burning. Because if you're looking into a, a room where the fire is burning on the 18th, 19th floor, then that's a lot. That is a life that's being yeah. extinguished within that. But most importantly, because we were a country we were experiencing the most fervent anti-immigrant rhetoric, you know, that the red tops can, can muster, I saw on that night a predominantly non-European emigrant community go out onto the streets and feed their fellow emigrants who had nothing. They were in their pajamas. Yeah. If you imagine your house is burnt down, yeah. 
that you got nothing. You haven't got a toothbrush, you haven't got a bed. It was a fellow carrying a mattress on his back that somebody had given him. This is in the Quran, a charitable act that yeah. people would not allow the others to go hungry. It was a powerful experience to be witness to. And I come back from that and I have spent the last year and a half making first a film about that and I'll concentrate the work in Galway in the next period of time to be very much opposing a narrative that identifies immigrants as as not participating in the society, as not charitable, oh, totally as dangerous. Totally because, right. you know, Sean, you know what it's like to live we here. We should see Dublin now. It's yeah. great because of immigrants who are cooking. The thing here, Sean, I was here in the 1980s. I was stopped by a yeah. special branch. I yeah. got stopped by the PTO. I was An the one that got stopped. Yeah. I went away when the Celtic Tiger happened and I used to be embarrassed going home at what we were turning into with the house in Bulgaria. It wasn't a colour of skin racism, really. It was more Eastern European racism. Our great-grandparents would be turning in their graves in Australia and America to think that when we hit jackpot, we wouldn't welcome people like them into uh, our fold. It's, it's, it's kind of... On, it's, on Islam, I have uh, similar views. However, I think radical Islam has a case to talk about. Any religion that tells me if I don't follow their God, I will be killed, I have a problem with. Of course, of course. Um, but, that, but that doesn't mean yeah. all... Muslims, absolutely. You know, absolutely. The, the funny thing is, that, you know, the Catholic Church, the Christ, sorry, the Christian Church, a thousand years after its invention, was like that. Crusades, etc. Mm -hmm. Religions get mm -hmm. drive towards. Did you also look at the, his, the recent history of Islam? It didn't, you know, it has for a wide variety of reasons. It's it's become more insular. It's become, uh, you know, it harks back to a halcyon past which never existed, yeah. which is brutal, yeah. absolutely barbaric. And nobody would, would expect that. You know, we live in this country in a secular society. If you wish to practice your religion, then more so than be welcome. It. You're more than welcome yeah. to do it. But you don't impact that, your ideology upon me. Yeah. You know? Because I'll tell you what I have a wider on. problem with it, which I kind of came up with recently. Irrespective of the religion, so it doesn't matter which God you believe in, the belief in God has this built in excuse for everything bad that's about to happen or is happening. It's God's way. This is inshallah, this is oive, this is yeah. what to do. And at a time when we need to clearly mobilize to possibly save the fucking planet or our species on the planet, I think it's a huge impediment to be able to go, well, sure. You know, and on another level for the, the non-abject poor, it's a salve. It's God's way that I'm wealthy or privileged. Mm -hmm. What can I do? I just worked hard. I picked myself up off the ground. Why don't you know? And for the poor, it's hope. It's like God exists. Look, they can do it. Maybe we can. And it's just so wrong on every day. And it doesn't even matter which religion you talk about. Like I'm not picking what, on one anyone. Of the, one of the interesting things I take from that is I got a lot of influence from older Irish immigrants. If you imagine like a man who was 50 in 1985 yeah, when I arrived here, yeah, yeah. you know, they believed in a lot of stuff. All of that stuff was was proved to be rubbish. I would recommend any Irish listeners to, to look at Philip Donnellan's film Portrait of Exile, which is a document of the 1960s of Irish experience in the United Kingdom. It's the go-to film if you ever see any I haven't stuff. Seen it. You'll see the black and white imagery. But what these men went through and experienced was horrendous. It's causing them their untimely deaths at a, at a young age at the moment. Yeah. Now, very important, these men went through stuff that probably similar to what I experienced, which was the notions that were put into you of nationalism, of state, of, yeah. of the, the putting on the green journey, jersey in an older sense, yeah. you know, in a past sense, all fell away because they saw the evidence of what was there. But I had talked to a guy from Clare once who spent a lot of time perhaps at, as we'd say, Frank O'Connor would have said, as a guest of the nation. And he said to me, he said, son, there's no reason or point in getting down on your knees praying for rain when your house is on fire. Call a fucking fire brigade. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Now that's tells to me a practicality about yeah. it. It doesn't mean that there's no absence of belief or faith, yeah. but there's a practicality that nobody else is going to pull you out of it. The Irish state won't pull you out of it. My, they had to be embarrassed. My, my to problem pay. is that the, the, the six-year-old communicant in Ireland this summer is being mumbo-jumboed at a time when that person, when they are 20, needs to not have all that kind of excuses inside Yeah, their I mean, head. you know, if you look at both of us, you know, we would have got that yeah. in droves and yeah. were able to we're kind of pull it apart. Good point, yeah. good point. You know, good I mean, point. I believe there's counter... But I have lots of friends who are 50 back in Dublin who are very, very intelligent, 
who still say I, to me, I, I, I agree you're mad. You know, yeah, you're, I mean, of course, is a god. Well, it, it's up to them. I mean, one of the things that I find interesting when speaking to people, and I agree with you, they're friends yeah. who have retained their faith yeah. and, and, and retained to stay within the Catholic Church. I respect their decision to do that and so on, but uh, I, I realize that they have a problem with the hierarchy of it. It's not necessarily their faith per se. An individual's sure. faith is a private matter. Yes, you yes. Know, it's yeah. up to them what yeah. they, whatever they believe in. But there must be a difficulty in terms of reconciling that belief and a charitable act. You know, yeah. I, I'm fascinated by the, the life of Christ. Christ yeah. Same here. I'm, I'm Christ studying is, the Gospels yeah. at the moment, which yeah. are hilarious. If you, if you, if you yeah. take I mean, I, I always return if I'm going to a, uh, a series of, of sort of drawings or sketches to begin a process, to return to the great narrative of the stations. You know, yes. I saw one recently in Venice, which is so moving yeah. because it is a great story. And what it unifies is everybody can identify with that suffering. Yeah. This individual, who, regardless of whether, whatever you feel about they're doing sure. for or not for you, Sins, but they're going through an experience that is horrendous. Yeah. <laughs> it's not. A, it's not a fun thing. No, you know? I know. That. But I like the narrative of that. You know, but, you know Matthew, cemetery. Mark, Luke. The you know, it's interesting to read the descriptors of his life laterally. Well, first of all, you know, he never admits in the first three gospels that he's God. He, John, John is the guy at the end who kind of starts doing the ad man on it. He didn't speak to anyone until the very end where he said... He can. You've, you've it's, it's me. Any text in that sense know, is, 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 is prone and open to interpretation. And I totally understand the need to have faith hmm. because it's a fucking scary nihilistic course, world without that. Yeah. You know? I'll give you an example, Sean, which I, I remember years and years ago when I would have been kind of taking on Rome as a one-man crusade yeah. and failing dismally. <laughs> yeah. But I saw a lady... I've seen so many people leaving at airports crying. You know, young women you yeah. know, saying goodbye to their family and stuff. I've seen it endlessly, you know. Um, I saw a woman once see off a couple of sons to America. And you know, they may have been going illegally, I don't know at the time, yeah. you know. But I remember her turning away saying, well, at least God will look after them. There's nothing I could argue with that. No, no. I said, look, if you want to believe that. Yeah, you know, no, I'm okay with like, all of that. It's all of that. Yeah, yeah. And in many ways, I necessarily, don't necessarily view that as being, certainly in an Irish context, as being as problematic, you know, no. I would see any influence in terms of education not to be benign, and I would certainly yes. be in favour of a removal of any indoctrination, indoctrination in terms of that, yeah. because ultimately, you know, it's impossible for one to get a, a rounded sort of um, basis when you have a, a biased opinion. You know, yes. my historical education, my religious education was biased. Yeah. There's no doubt about yeah. that, and it was indoctrination. And probably all re all historical. Education is biased really, well, from the yeah. perspective of whoever the hell But ultimately, it. you know, the thing about it is if you have an uncertainty about whatever it is that you're doing, you want to impose it upon somebody else. My reality is I don't give a shit really what people do. <laughs> yeah, you know, true. I really don't. I'm the same. I, I, I have some concerns about the yeah, future of, course, of society. You know, of but us. I realize my sphere of influence on is, is quite limited. Yeah. You know? I have been privileged in the sense that I've been given an opportunity to have a voice and, and yeah. use that accordingly. But I recognize no, no illusions about the responsibility of that voice. You know, yeah. I take responsibility serious, but I also recognize that I mightn't be playing for the second half of my life. I might be playing for the next 30, 40 years. And I see that as a wider context of a historical dialectic that's going on. So the two Irish lads having a chat in London, are we going to be constantly tortured for the rest of our lives and are all Irish people and is this unique to Ireland given what happened to our country or to us and I'm not going to say it's unique of course because there are countries that have had terrible terribly worse things happen to them in the last while but is it something uniquely Irish that we have to constantly keep having these discussions about what it means to be Irish and, and whether it's truth or whether it's fantasy or I don't know really I mean my understanding of questioning your identity came from the fact that I was stopped once by a special branch and I asked them, How did, why did you stop me? Did, you, did I look Irish? They didn't answer me and I was curious as why, what identified me as being Irish. You know? But I think it was something I had to go through to understand my own relationship to country, to where, where are one's allegiances. I don't really worry too much about it now. Although I have worked to identify the great contribution that the Irish community have made to Ireland. And that's what Philip Donlan's film I mentioned earlier goes. I can't remember the exact figures now, but the amount of money that went back from here to Ireland between 1939 oh, and 69 yeah. kept communities alive, doubtless, yeah. you know. And that was done under the auspices of, of this notion of responsibility, local and civic responsibility. Yeah. 
I don't necessarily feel that local or civic responsibility, although I would be a supporter of my local GAA club, you know, yeah. I'm a great fo Gaelic football fan. And it's funny, really, there's a, a guy I've met who is the um, cultural officer at the Ar Camden Irish Centre when I was talking to some of the people there, and he said, um, I was saying to him, I said, you know, I, I'm kind of getting to the end of being talking about Ireland. And he said, well, there's only one cure for a person, an Irish person living abroad who concerns themselves with Ireland is to go on back and live in Ireland and then you won't care anymore. And I thought it was interesting that he would say that. I think that's it, true. I don't think it's true no. either. I think he was being a bit facetious yeah, by saying yeah. so, but he was more of a concern for people outside yeah. than it would be necessarily, particularly the, the identity factor, where my, you come from. My yeah. observation of, of being back now three years is anger, that there's just such an acceptance. You know, there's a kind of a... Yeah, sure, that's the way. Yeah, yeah. And I just go, no, no. We have to like, we, you can do that about the pint being bad or whatever, but you can't do that about no, five thousand kids homeless. You have to go. Yeah. No, this is not good enough. In, I think in our country, a wash with cash again. Yeah. I'm going. You have got to fix this fucking problem. And it's interesting, Sean. I didn't meant to mention again. One of the things I noticed is my mum passed away during the turn, you know, of, of the the economic thing, and I was I was conscious of the fact that. I realized that it was a generation prior to mine that were fearful of poverty. You know, there was only an option of boat or dole. No, well, my, my father, I mean, there was tenements, you know? I mean, there yeah. was 22 room tenements. Yeah, yeah. There was guys who used to pay to stay, sleep and stand and up yeah. uh, in his lifetime. So he, he looks at our now going, what's the fucking problem, Sean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I want to segue to, to, sure. to uh, could, it was actually a really good build up to you. Because, you know, the, the, the research that I've, the little bit of research I've done on you, and I, I kind of went on kind of one thing and dug deep rather than going across everything because it was so full of profundity in my view. But there, there's, a, there's a tortured thing going on inside you about whether it's even worth doing art and whether mm, it's even well worth spotted. it's worth well you doing art. Yeah, well spotted. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's interesting and, and I, I do appreciate you picking up on that because... Um, I go into the National Gallery here quite frequently, right. right? And I used to know how to go from one room to the other by the paintings in there. I could identify them and right. I could position myself. Now, if they move the painting room, I'm fucked because yeah. I don't know where I am. But I was in there one day and I was like, you know, I turn left at the Rubens and I know I go down that. How yeah. did I find myself from where I came from growing up in an environment where oh, there was yeah. a great story or a t oral t tradition, but not a great visual culture? How did I find myself? in the middle of this, you know, I, I go to places to see paintings, mm -hmm. to see artworks. How did that happen? But also, I wouldn't necessarily say that it has been an easy life. When I was much younger, I met uh, a performance group that were much older than I, were, I was at the time. And I kind of thought that there was a life and then there was the not life. You had to take the life and the consequences of that life. And the, the, the desire to continue doing that has stayed with me for for a long period of time. I've never considered that it, it was something that I would not do, but also it's something that I haven't really relished sometimes doing. It's been hard. A couple of things I want to run by you. I've thought of the type of painting I can achieve should I reach infirmity. It would be small and without great gesture. Yeah. I, I think uh, that means that I, as long as there's an opportunity to create, I'll keep doing it. I look at the works that I would have appreciated, you know, the works of, of uh, I mean, I was only recently in Paris and, and looking at the works of, of Monet, who had cataracts. I'm intrigued by the possibility of limited skill reducing you, because in many ways, stuff came easy, drawing and, and the ability to be able to do that came easy. I've had to work hard to make it pertinent to me, you know? But you, I mean, you could, you could look at someone like Frank Lloyd Wright and go, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm just intrigued by that quote, which is, it seems to be eschewing wisdom a little bit, or the, or the importance of wisdom, or the importance of being able to go, maybe I'm reading it wrong, it is suggesting to me that you're saying that at a, past a certain point, I won't be able to do it. Anymore. Well, it's curious, I mean, you spend a vast majority of your life trying to achieve a language, yeah. and then a short period of time being able to excel at that language before yes. the facilities in which allowed you to create are, are kind of reduced. I have a, an attraction for the later works of many artists, particularly yeah. Michelangelo, Picasso, yeah. money to a certain extent, because I realized that that depreciation was, in a sense, what the essence of what you're trying to get to. I've always believed that there's been, you're just trying to create one work in your lifetime. It just takes all your fucking lifetime to try and achieve it. And you call this a moment. Yeah, there's, there's moments. And but the moment 
in that particular essay that you referenced, you know, was it was a kind of crisis over a few years ago where I thought, mm. why did I spend my time? And curiously, I found myself in a position where a piece of work I made myself moved me, and that was instrumental in beginning a crisis. Of this is on doubt. This this is, on doubt. Yeah, yeah. that was it. Well, that's where I, I kind yeah. of. I, mean, I want to quote another couple of things to you. You know, the public role alone as presented by the artist may be considered equal to any artistic product. Possibly. I only use the biopic as cover. Yeah. An artist pretending to be an artist. Yeah. And a lot in a, in a lot of the stuff I hear you do, there's this huge am I worth it? Am I I mean and of course, and, 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 and and you question this, I wrote it down somewhere. This idea that doubt is somehow I think doubt's a great thing because it keeps you yeah. humble. But there's a difference, Sean, sorry, just oh, to identify oh, yeah, oh. between doubt and doubt of self. Yeah? Right. And I had to make that differential. I mean in that particular essay I realised that the, the doubt you leave is the doubt for leaving a space for an absent deity that you know is not coming. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. So you know that's not going to but arrive. But then you're not you're two steps away from nihilism. Yeah. Well you are, but you're also you're still achieving. I mean the very yeah. practical act of creating is in itself an affirmation. Because yeah. were one to believe not that, that wasn't possible, then you wouldn't bother. Why would you bother? Why you know? do you bother? Because you can't leave the narrative to the ignorant of this historical epoch. If you're looking at imagination, the ultimate cause of that is to try and see what will be the next the next way of living. Looking at Auden and Yeats over on doubt is very interesting because there's a tennis match between the bombast of, of Yeats's and his doubt and also Auden's realization that art makes nothing happen. But and our, and our greats would be like Yeats and Beckett and Joyce, and I'm far from being a scholar of these guys, but you know, they exude doubt. Well, it's interesting. I was thinking on the way down because it's just past Bloomsday here internationally, and I mean, fantastic. I'm, I'm, I read just it was a, a very pivotal experience to read Ulysses as a young man. I tried three, four times. Just hit me. I don't, I'm not a great, you know, I, I don't read a lot of fiction, poetry, more some fact based stuff. But this work signally was like, I just kind of put it down when, you know, in a funny, arrogant, youthful sort of way, I went, well, I don't have to read another book. That's done it now. Well, there is that. And, but what I have appreciated over the period of time was the heroic nature of Joyce and also his confidence. He did say he would go out and get his confidence. confidence. And he does. In Do you general, think you're confident? I think that you have to go from a perspective where I wouldn't say as a younger man you would veer from confidence to pessimism in the space of a few minutes. But I kind of know the things that I'm good at. You know, yeah. my partner's child was very, very small when I realized she had a greater sense of color than I did. You color blind, yeah? No, I wouldn't say. I mean, I look at it from the perspective of saying the usage of, of color okay. and the way of color. Ah, when she was doing her painting. When she was doing her painting, she had a okay. liberation okay. and a Great. freedom yeah, that yeah, I didn't yeah. necessarily have. I had to learn that. And that's also nurture. It is, but it's also before anything else comes in, you know, the question yeah. and the doubt and but so the on. the permission. The permission to do that, yeah. Which we wouldn't yeah, have maybe yeah. had. And that, and that, the that, sky that. would not have been allowed to be green when we were growing Well, that, that's possibly true. I don't remember a lot of drawing as a child, you yeah, know. As, as a teenager, yeah. yes, but not as a child. I came into visual art through sculpture originally and then into performance. So it's only been in the recent past that I've kind of started to go back in. But I always had uh, drawing as a central focus of the practice. The other thing that I wanted to do was this failure may have been the end goal all along thing. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. you use Shackleton and McDonough. Which well, this is interesting, yeah, because that was particularly about the 1916 experience. Yeah. And the idea that... Um, but martyrdom is not failure. Not in a sense it is, but it's you're not looking... not great for you. Yeah, but you're, look, you're looking at the sense of... What, what were they trying to set out to achieve? And that, in a sense, was a failure. But in a British sense, the failure was a great heroic thing that Chapleton and Tom Crean, Philip yeah, Perryman, yeah, yeah. Uh, managed to achieve. And also within 1916, it was a failure because they failed their ultimate objective. But I also wanted to make the point that history has a way of changing facts to make something that has happened that, that could be seen or deemed a failure yeah. to becoming something that actually was a positive and uh, inspirational to other people to continue. But ultimately, I was looking at it from a, more from a psychoanalytical perspective. Yes, I could, yeah, I could feel that. Um, because I went into psychoanalysis myself during that time. Right, did you have a problem? Did you have a... I felt that I needed to understand what it was that had just happened, which was, ultimately, was this worth it to spend the life 
living this way because I've chosen all my adult life to live the life of an I can artist. guarantee it's better than working in an office nine to five. I've already I worked that one out. I can't. <laughs> but you know, I have a curious thing, Sean. When I meet somebody, I ask them how they work. I said, "What time do you go into work?" Because I yeah. don't know. I don't know what it is that people do, so I'm curious as to how they. Survive. And I have, I have to say, because I tried to retire, <laughs> kind of bolted a bit early on that one. And I wanted to try and do my art and writing, and, and I've written a book, and, and I'm trying to get this element of guilt associated with just being. Even if you're, you, you, we, I had this conversation with some reason. He said, "Failure is only failure if you see it as failure with things that you do in your life." I, I don't. Sorry, just if it's well, any use, yeah. I will take opinion, of course, from people yeah. I respect, but only I will know whether I've achieved what I set out to achieve. And one of the reasons why On Doubt was interesting to me was that I'd made a piece of work for the Dublin Fringe Festival mm. that wasn't ready. So that's a, yeah, we've been talking about around that. You, 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 were, you, you beautifully phrased it as I was doing a painting in 2015 for 2016. <laughs> I didn't make it in time. Yeah. And then yeah, you yeah. made that the story. Yeah, it became, well also I recognized that if this image was actually an image that maybe could be appropriated for some use that I mightn't, I mightn't agree with, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, Joyce used to be on the back of the ten pound note, mm -hmm. but somehow they managed to make him look toothless. Yeah, there was no, photo, yeah, yeah, but there was no mention of, of you know of the great the great experiment in his work. There was yeah. no, certainly no mention of the, the, the sexual relationship between him and his wife, which was fascinating. But it's a know. piece of currency is it would, 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 do you think Joyce would have been happy to have been honored that way I think he would I don't think you know ultimately for Joyce his, his confidence was sufficient and I'm yeah. only speculating I'm another man yeah. now you know I, I've had enough trouble trying to figure out what's going on with me he was kind of run out of Ireland he, yeah he, I mean, he, he, he was banned he, yeah. you know he was like, but he wasn't, even John McGarren and people like that you know you Beckett, like they all fucking went off like you it did. did. I mean, they Ulysses, went. I suppose, in a sense, was. I don't think they ever banned it. But if you came in with a couple, somebody totally take yeah, you yeah, off, was it? Yeah, I, yeah. I wasn't sure. I always, I was under the impression. Was an American that, woman member. Yeah, but that was the, that was the American case between the the publication of the obscene and the French woman. All women apparently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They had to smuggle them in. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, the the interesting thing about it was I don't necessarily think in his case Ireland would be that. I By think the way, there Dennis, were, the movie was banned until two thousand. Which one? The, the, you, the, the 1964 one? black and white movie well, with, with, uh, with, with Milo Shea. Yeah, yeah, was yeah. Was banned of until course. 2000. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I was telling people that um, how we used to listen to the life of Brian on on I LP. I had that yeah. up. I knew every word yeah, because we couldn't see it. Ah, yeah, it was yeah. banned. We just talked about radio being a yeah, bigger yeah. thing. Yeah, that's right. And also, you know, like in art school, a lot of my friends were in fashion. They were gay men coming out, yeah. that was illegal. Contraception, yeah. all yeah. of these things. Yeah. We're better in that regard. I all. think so, yeah. And I think that the gesture of uh, defiance to make Ireland a very liberal society is very admirable, but it doesn't get to the central function no. of what is a restrictive ideology. It's like we're at the gate and we're breaking down the door. I hope so. I mean, I can't say for, com you know, for, for a degree of certainty because I'm not enough experience yeah. of living here and I know many years ago I made a decision you you almost draw one leg into one country and I remember I was in Sainsbury's and I bought uh, kitchen cutlery and I thought you've made a decision there consciously or unconsciously to live here and put your Very energy good. here you know I vote here I don't vote not, and I have no yeah. say within that and I I'm careful I feel not to comment too much on what I you know I have opinions about it and, and that's a more of a historical thing well I, I'm a great believer there's someone said you can't be a prophet in your own country but I think people who have lived outside and can look back and have seen the world and have seen Ireland standing, which is very good in the world. Mm. Our standing is much yeah. more ahead, I think, of the reality. But, you know, we have a great standing. And it was very good for me mm. not being English or not being British. Oh, it made a difference at times, yeah. <laughs> Achieving Absolutely. goals causes more, not less chaos. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Is yeah. that because you, you become famous and the attendant? No, no, no. It means more to the idea that one is unprepared for the res results of achieving a goal you set out to, you know, from a, from a psychoanalytical point of view, yeah. you know, because ultimately I was, it wasn't just psychoanalytical. Cross, cross that with the idea that you want, like you, you said, you want to achieve one great moment or thing. I wouldn't in essence be trying to achieve that, it would be a consequence of, a, of, of pursuing that activity. Yeah. I think in the context of that, I was intrigued by the fact, and that was what preempted the psychoanalysis, it wasn't, it was, it, 
curious type of psychoanalysis. Yeah. It was psychoanalysis under a Lacanian psychoanalysis. What does that mean? Jacques Lacan is a, is, was a student of, well, he was a, a follower of Freud, but he had very strong opinions himself. You know, his, his probably most recognizable quote was the unconscious, unconscious is structured like a language. But there was a lot about desire and the pursuit of desire and inevitably the lack, which I think in on doubt is referenced. So it's Buddhist issue? Or no, I mean, it would be the, the concept of the lack is something that is inevitable in every person's pursuit of desire or yeah. achievement of desire. We don't Ultimately, have something we wanted. When you get there, you realize that's not I what want you want. Something wanted. else now. But also, oh, okay. you try and say, how do I identify with the experience yeah, yeah. of spending a lifetime yeah. in the achievement of something, such as Bobby Pierce? Or I, I chose um, McDonough. McDonough, who yeah. was more of a poet, yeah. I felt. Yeah. In disrespect to the poetry of Bobby Pierce, I'm sure it was very good, but for me, it was McDonough. But that would, be, that would be kind of Buddhist, because the root of all evil is desire. You know, it would. You're, I would you're, make, just ra- you're just chasing yeah. rabbits down holes. You know, I would make a distinction, though, within that context that it doesn't, you know, whereas Buddhism agrees with the acceptance of that, perhaps one aspect of it is to go back into the lack and then try and work through it again. Is to itch or, support or tear the wound, you know, instead of letting it and accepting that it needs to heal. So yeah. there may be uh, similarities within both, but there is certainly within the curiosity of achieving a goal then what do you do next? I think it was Beckett, wasn't it, who came into that experience of saying, you know, it was, it was an experience of achieving a relative degree of success, you know, which almost was catastrophic for him, you know, on a personal basis. Yeah. You know. I, I, I didn't have that same experience. I think you either go absolute dickhead and think that, you know, you're somehow, it's, you've achieved this thing and you're great because you've achieved it, so you become a dickhead. Or you go... I've got to do it again to, to, to show myself that I can do it. You know what I mean? The, the, I prefer to yeah. be in the latter camp. I prefer to be the guy who got. I, I didn't. I look at luck yeah. and I look at, you know, yeah. you know, I chanced on things and, you know, working in my business, it was, which is so shallow. But there are people out there who think, oh, I'm the fucking greatest creative in the whole world. Mm. And yeah, you made a couple of ads, funny ads for a nappy or something back mm. in the day. But yeah, please. I suppose you never underestimate the, the influence of. Uh, of uh, of what people around you are saying as well. I mean, I, like I said, it, my, my kind of responsibility is ultimately to continue to practice to the best of my ability. And there's a curious thing that you're intrigued by your own ability as it, as it increases. I how you can, You know, how you can get better at doing yes. something. And inevitably you want to step up another level, yeah. you know. My, my origins were based in the idea of of responsibility, collectivism, you know, but mostly as an individual yeah. is about, and I'm intrigued by the position of the, and the role of the artist in society, so yes. I'm conscious of that. What I'm doing now is part of that. And you well. do believe that the artist matters, right? I do, yeah. I'm not sure which artist, but some artists. <laughs> you matter. <laughs> what do you say to your, la- to your uh, Killarney kid in the cinema? What would I say to him? Yeah, if you could go get back, back and into get back in the other cinema. You're, you're supposed watch to be the watching the Jungle Book. Book, you know, not Apocalypse Now. Um, what would I say to him? I don't know. Okay, you can, and I think it's important at some stage in your life to kind of say, look, you may have got that wrong, but what else could you do being who you were? Yeah. You see that it's remarkable what you've done coming out of that background to where you've become. Yeah, I see that the people have um, settled for whatever corral yeah, has been pushed but into. I've never kind of looked at it as others you know I no, kind of, yeah. you know my, my responsibility was to try and explore the first and foremost to undo the indoctrination that yeah. took a while yeah but I did it through the artwork I've always found an outlet through the activity of yeah. creativity to come to an understanding of what my life is about but most importantly I live in the world I mean you know it's just one thing that I do I would have spoken to my younger self but my younger self wouldn't have listened to me, you know? That's great. That's why you are who you are. And um, that mirrors all the way back to infinity. <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> thanks for being on my podcast. Not so, Sean. It's been a pleasure. Keep doing it. And I want to I wanna see the thing that you decide is the thing. Is the, is the thing. moment that you achieve. Sure. Look after yourself. It might be my decision. Mind yourself. Thanks, Sean. Cheers.